Hello everybody and welcome to Chop and Brew. I am your host Chip Walton. This episode is all about the hops and not just the hops, the new hops, the new hops on the block. As we all know, hops are key to the flavor, aroma, and mouthfeel of any given beer style. And with so many new varieties coming out every year, that combination of characteristics is nearly endless and it's hard to keep track of what's new, what kind of flavors it gives off, what goes well with what. You could spend weeks, years, forever test brewing with these hops. And while that's all good and fun, it's also nice to save some time every now and then. In steps home brewer Nathan Smith. Nathan Smith is an award-winning home brewer, a member of the Doze and Brewing Network Homebrew Clubs, as well as a Brewing Network Brewcaster. He's a hop-obsessed home brewer and a good friend of Chop and Brew, so Nathan was nice enough to let me document his presentation at last summer's NHC in Grand Rapids. The title of this presentation, Brewing with New Hop Varieties, in which Nathan lays out nearly a dozen new hops, their attributes, and the results of his test brewing with these different hops. Hops like Legacy, Belma, Saphir, Azaka, and several numbered only experimental hops. I should also point out that this presentation is available in PDF form, uh, not only at the AHA's archives, but Nathan's own brewing site. Those links will be hyperlinked below this episode. We wanna give big shout outs ahead of time to Nathan Smith for letting us come document his presentation also to the AJ for letting us in the door with our camera and mics and the Brewing Network, as well as Brew Your Own Magazine for their continued support of Chop and Brew. You can also support Chop and Brew by buying merchandise at the online superstore, shirts, stickers, new buttons, and uh, donating one time or recurring subscription to make sure that Chop and Brew keeps rolling along. So with the pitches aside, let's get on with the information. Nathan Smith brewing with new hop varieties. Hop for hop, brew for brew. So we're going to talk about brewing with new hop varieties today. Oh yeah, and by the way, hopefully Justin won't sue me for using the hop grenade on this slide. We'll find out later. I didn't ask for permission. So there's a beer coming around right now, VNA9 Session IPA, that uh, Mike McDowell and myself and Adam Mills from Crankers put together. Uh, nice little session beer featuring three of the hop varieties that we'll go into more detail a little bit later. Uh, Belma Legacy and a new numbered variety from Hop Steiner 05256. A nice sessionable beer that you can drink in quantity. Uh, you folks are probably feeling a little bit tired today, so uh, maybe this beer will help you a little bit. Special thanks to Hops Direct for providing the hops that we used in the Whirlpool and uh, Faction Brewing out of Alameda for help with the 05256. So let's think about new hops. Uh, as you've probably noticed over the last few years, there's a dizzying array of new varieties available to us in the homebrew and craft brew world. Uh, pops such as Mosaic, El Dorado, Belma, Azaka, and that's just the ones that we know of that have names. There are many more, they're just numbers right now from the various breeders and suppliers. Uh, in the past, new hops that were available to us from the American breeders specifically were kind of variations on existing successful American hops, such as a Super Cascade or more crop-stable version of something that already existed, or maybe a variation on a noble variety that was more suitable to the North American growing climate. Uh, but we see something new emerging now, and there's kind of new sensory things that we're getting off the new hop varieties that are available to us. So uh, it kind of makes us ask us, how should we approach these? And are they all intended to be IPA hops? I would beg to differ that they are, and we have to think about them in, in new and cool ways. Uh, so why bother? There are so many of the classic varieties that are available, and you can brew almost every style in the BJCP guidelines without having to go into these new esoteric varieties. Um, I think there's something to a lot of these new hops. Maybe you just want something different, or maybe you want to build an intangible complexity into your beer to do something different to separate yourself from what else is going on out there. Uh, we think about hops as one of, still one of the most unique ingredients for adding complexity into beer, and that's increasing even more so with the new varieties that are available to us. So what happened? Over the last 10 years, things seem to be changing. Um, let's take a step back. So the, uh, this is a great quote from Jason Peralt, uh, Peralt Farms from the Hop Breeding Program. Um, he talked about a decade ago that 
most of the breeders and growers were just concerned with trying to mimic noble aroma type hops. That's what they could sell. Uh, now we have a shift, and that shift for those guys in particular started with a hop they called YCR014. They really went out on a limb in the mid 90s and bred for this hop that they thought would be an interesting hop for the craft brewing market, something that would have a signature character for craft brewers specifically. Why would these guys spend so much time trying to mimic noble hops for such a long time? Uh, three letters, and not the three letters that sell beer, not IPA, but uh, the three letters in the macro brewing industry, uh, Bud Miller Coors, really drove the sales of hops for such a long time. So things have started to change now. So YCR014, let's think about that one for a minute. That was originally selected in the mid-90s, and expanded acreage in the late 90s. Uh, Jason Peralt talks about that hop as one that they really bred to have a unique character for the craft brewing market. Uh, by 2011, YCR014 was a huge success, but by 2001, it was almost a complete failure. They almost pulled it from the ground entirely due to lack of interest. Um, someone started buying YCR014 in quantity in 2002 and 2003. That kind of saved the hop. Uh, so who was that who started buying this hop in quantity in, in 2002? Uh, this man needed no introduction, and I'm not talking about me. <laughs> so that, and that hop, YCR014, was Simcoe. And that was really a, a defining character hop for a beer like Pliny the Elder. And Vinny was an early adopter of that hop and really made it work in a beer, really gave that beer an interesting signature complexity that other IPAs did not have at the time. So let's think about hop breeding for a second and how we got here. Uh, things have come a long way since Simcoe. Let's contrast that story with Citra. Citra was an absolute success by 2009. It was only released in 2008. But that was a hop, hop that was almost lost to the archives. All the crossbreeding had done, been done for that hop in the early 90s, uh, before most of us had ever used a web browser, and before most of us had ever heard of anything like Google. It didn't even exist yet. Uh, all the breeding and all the genetic material for that hop had already been defined at that point. Um, and Peter Darby of uh, Y-Hops, I think is a great quote, and he talks about there's so much crossbred material that's already in the archives for various hops that uh, we haven't even got to yet. Uh, so Citra has become the rock star brewing hop of the craft brew world. So we're we'll talking about rock star like this. Uh, this is the brewcasters at a uh, Steel Panther concert, of course. I like how most of the other people in the audience look kind of bored, but we're freaking out. But really, I think a cool story for Citra on the, on the homebrew level is uh, Kelsey McNair has made a great signature beer out of Citra. Hop Foo IPA has done extremely well for him in competition. And there's a really interesting story of a successful beer that features a new hop, and get, you're getting the most out of it with what he's doing. I encourage you to look that recipe up if you haven't tried it before. Back issues of Zymergy have uh, featured this very well. So in the past, hops that were expressive and interesting would have been discarded. Breeding programs now have a unique opportunity more than ever before to sell interesting characterful hops into the craft brew and home brew market. The breeders take this approach more than ever before, that if it has good yield and is agronomically stable, we're going to get this hop to market. Um, breeding typically takes between 8 and 10 years, and only 1 in 40,000 hops makes it. Uh, we have this pocket of hops that seem to be emerging from the breeding programs that have mid to high alpha, about 9 to 12 percent, and moderate cohumulone, 24 to 32, and fairly high total oil content. Uh, those are some interesting range of statistics to look for. We see this pattern repeating over and over again. And so where are these hops coming from, these new hop varieties that we're working with? There's ma main breeding programs, uh, Select Botanicals, or hop uh, breeding company, Hop Steiner, ADHA, the Dwarf Hop Association, uh, USDA, the public taxpayer funded program, and the Hull Research Institute in Germany, and then individual so farms such as Peterberg Farms, uh, Belma, and Legacy, two of the hops that we're tasting in this beer that we brought today, come from that individual grower. So to summarize breeding, the breeders are exploring the broad ex expression of hop genetic material to bring us something more interesting than we've ever had before. We're getting increased single hop complexity and higher oil content out of each of these new hops. And we think about the US craft brewing industry uh, using between 1.2 and 1.3 pounds per barrel on average or more. This all adds up to a lot more hop consumption than in the past. And I think the breeders really have an opportunity to do more than ever before to provide interesting, unique stuff for the craft brewing market. So let's think about the sensory descriptors that we're getting out of some of these new hops. In addition to citrus, pine, and resin, I think that uh, dank is one that's really 
uh, become uh, in the forefront over the last few years out of, and, and one that's a little bit controversial to even use as a term, but I think we all know what we're referring to there, and that's kind of the uh, marijuana, very resinous quality that you get out of some of the new hop varieties. Uh, but beyond that, I think some of the more important ones for the brand new hop varieties are the ideas of tropical fruit and berry and melon. We see that repeating over and over again out of the new hop varieties that are available to us. As well as I want to comment quickly on some of the descriptors at the bottom here. Uh, coconut, tobacco, cocoa, vanilla, tea, licorice. I think you're seeing those a little bit less than some of the other tropical berry and melon. But you do see those a little bit and I think that's an interesting area we'll see a bit more of an intriguing area to play around with. I'm going to get into some specifics in a little bit. Uh, as a side note, tropical berry and melon, uh, those three descriptors, I encourage you to, to, to attend Gordon Strong's talk later today about the new BJCP guidelines. You'll see those three in particular in some of the categories for American hop forward beers such as pale ale and IPA due to these new hop varieties and the use of them. So when we talk about these descriptors, these new sensory terms, uh, tropical berry, melon, or even dank. Where are those coming from? That's uh, coming from essential oils. I won't go deeply into this and read through the slide, but you guys are familiar with some of the uh, compounds that we talk about when we talk about essential oils in hops. Uh, I'd like to point out one in particular, 4-MMP. 4-MMP is something that Stan Hieronymus talked about in his book, For the Love of Hops. And that was one of the first times I'd heard it described and defined the way it is in that book. I highly encourage you to read that book if you haven't, if you're into uh, new hop varieties and kind of the history and the, and the status of where we are with hops today. He discusses 4-MMP as this muscat grape, black currant, this uh, compound that occurs naturally in grapes, wine, green tea, and grapefruit juice is a defining character of New World hops and hops from the Southern Hemisphere as well. Uh, you don't get 4-MMP as a statistic on the GC data or on the sensory data that you get with a sheet when you get the statistics about a new hop, but that is something that I think we perceive sensory-wise as a big differentiator for new hop varieties versus the classic noble hops. And to kind of summarize hop oils without dwelling on this too long, I think that there's a lot of new research happening in this area, and we know less about hop oils than we think we do. We have actually money behind this and, and an interest in understanding what's going on with hop oils due to the aggressive use of hopping in the late kettle and dry hopping. Uh, and this will really push us forward in terms of understanding hop oils a little bit better. Uh, we really don't know much and we're on the tip of the iceberg. Understanding hop oils is in its infancy. So how do we get these hops? Um, well, of course, you have to break into the supply room at your local brewery and, and look for the weird hops that have names you don't recognize or uh, numbers on the boxes that uh, don't seem to add up in your head. Um, no, of course, uh, many of these are available on the open market and uh, thanks to Chip Walton for taking these pics of me while I was stealing some hops out of the supply room at Summit, which they were kind enough to, to share with me. But the point of this talk is not about how Nate had access to special hops that most people didn't. Uh, I'm gonna talk about hops in this uh, a little bit later, very specific hops that you can get in the homebrew market and that are pretty widely available to us at this point. There's a, a couple that I'll discuss that aren't, but in general, many of the hops that I think are really interesting are hops that anyone can get. So when we get these random new hops with weird names and just numbers, uh, how should we approach them? Can we get a lot just off the statistics that the grower gives us? Can we just do a rub test or maybe make some hop tea and get enough to uh, make some conclusions about the hop? I really don't think so. You have to brew with them to figure them out. And uh, give you one guess who said that quote, you actually have to brew with them to figure them out. And that's another quote from Vinny. Uh, and I think he's absolutely right. You can't really get what you think you're gonna get from the hops just by evaluating them right out of the bag. They'll give you maybe a clue, but you often get very different results in the kettle. Um, and so let's think about our time and how we can use it wisely to get the most out of brewing, actually brewing with these hops. Uh, most of us, myself and most of you guys probably, you have a day job and you don't have the ability to produce 30 barrels of wort daily, so you can play around with a bunch of different hop varieties. Uh, when you actually get around to doing a brew day, maybe you have two, three different new experimental hops on hand. Uh, there's ways in which I think we can use all of them or use a few of them at once and, and really separate things out and do some interesting experiments. So let's think about a brew day with new hops. Let's say you have two brand new hop varieties available, maybe one numbered one, maybe one that has a name you think they might fit into a beer in an interesting way. Um, 
let's think about ways in which we can split the wart and do multiple experiments at once, uh, get the most out of our time. Uh, one, re one way in which I really like to do this is that we'll maybe produce 10 or 15 gallons of wort and split it among multiple fermenters and with a different hopback charge each time. In order to do that, you need a pump and you're going to need a way to uh, chill the beer like a counter flow chiller or a plate chiller. And it's necessary, unless you have multiple hopbacks, uh, to clean the hopback in between each individual charge. We're becoming a little more comfortable on the homebrew level with having hot wort sitting in the kettle more than we used to in the past. Uh, Mike McDowell talked about this a little bit a couple days ago in his talk, the importance of trying out a Whirlpool if you haven't tried it before. Um, so don't be scared of the extended hot rest while you clean out the uh, hop back and reload it again with a different hop. I think you can get a lot out of your brew day that way by having exposure of that hop on the hot side and then maybe repeat it again on the cold side. Uh, but I can't express enough if you do consider doing this, um, be very careful. The, the hop back is a vessel that's under pressure. Uh, wear safety glasses and, and use gloves so you don't burn yourself. Kind of drive that point home. Here's some pictures kind of summarizing how I would normally do that. Um, good lineup, right foot pump, right into the hop back, right into the plate chiller, and collect your first five gallons with a hop back charge of an interesting hop. Be safe, put on gloves and safety glasses and then change out the hop back with a different hop. You can use things like, the, um, like a, just a straight old plastic bucket or uh, the carboy stands to help kind of stabilize the hop back as you clean it and set things up. Bucket of sanitizer and quick disconnects are a handy way that you can keep things clean and keep your life a little bit sane when you try this. It makes the brew day a little bit hectic, but there aren't often times when I can produce 15 gallons of wort, definitely not every week. You can get a little bit more out of it if you're trying techniques like this. So let's look at it from a flow chart type of diagram to get, kind of visualize this. Uh, 15 gallons of wort production, maybe you collect the first five with no hop back, and then collect the next five with hop back number one, and then the final five with hop back number two. You could even split the different yeasts at that point, and different carboys, and then try the same dry hop that you tried on each hop back to kind of reinforce what you've done on the hop side hot side. Let's get a little bit more into style selection that you would think about for new hops. I think that in the past, and this is definitely a very valid approach to approaching new hop varieties, we just brew a simple pale ale, something along the lines of the uh, hop to it recipe from Russian River. A uh, nice little simple pale ale that allowed you to showcase a new hop variety. There's definitely nothing wrong with that approach. I think you can get a lot out of doing that. I've decided to take a more targeted approach when looking at new hop varieties and we'll go straight into maybe an IPA if we think the hop would do well there, or maybe different styles. So let's think about an IPA wort for a hop that seems to be pitched to the IPA brewing market, uh, something maybe from the hop breeding program, one of the HBC numbered hops, or maybe a hop like Mosaic. First time we'll play around with it, maybe we'll just go straight into an IPA and do a control batch on, for the first five gallons with the hop like Simcoe, where you know it's gonna perform well. And then maybe hop back, no, for, or hop back A, would have the first new interesting hop and then the final five gallons new hop B. Maybe play around with the yeast slightly or maybe just keep it all at once to keep your life simple. On the contrast, a lot of the more delicate hop varieties that we're starting to see that maybe have more of a noble oil profile, you could do a more of like a Pilsner type of wort. Very simple, straightforward wort composition there uh, with a Kolsch or a lager yeast. Similar concept for a hop that seems to have a little bit of this uh, cocoa or woodiness, you could send a mildly dark wort with a little bit of roasty quality after those hops and maybe get a little bit of an interesting thing there. Same type of concept, you do a control first for the first five gallons and then two other interesting hops with an American ale yeast or maybe something like a Scottish or an English yeast for the final five gallons just to play around with it. So enough messing around, let's get into some very specific new varieties. I'm going to talk about these specific hop varieties and there's a recipe I have that goes along with each. I encourage you guys to download this presentation later, and those are all clickable links if you want to see the exact recipe that, that we're going to talk about. Um, recipes available both in Beersmith and, and Brew Toad. So let's talk specific hops. Uh, Belma is one that caught my interest early on. You read through the descriptors and you see things like berry and strawberry and melon. That sounded pretty cool. And the hop was fairly inexpensive and, and unheard of and available through Hops Direct. It's a hop that Originally, I wanted to send after IPA. 
that sounded pretty cool. Let's do an IPA that has some slight strawberry or melon character. Um, I think I couldn't have been more wrong, but uh, it was one, thing, one interesting way to try and approach this hop. We did use this hop in the session beer that you're tasting today, and if you look for it really carefully, you might get a little bit of a berry or a melon quality out of that beer, and I think that Belma's driving a little bit of that, but it's definitely one that's in the background on that beer. What I finally did decide on was a, a Kolsch or a Saison. I think that is a really appropriate style for this hop, and you get really the most out of what that hop can bring to the table. Um, but let's review my IPA approach for that hop first. So much like I was discussing earlier, uh, approach this like I would a standard Simcoe beer and just use Belma in place of that. And Mosaic was another hop that I was just getting my hands on at about that same time and batch split with that method, using Belma kind of in the middle position. But I uh, couldn't have been more wrong. It, the beer wasn't terrible, but it didn't really showcase what best things you could get out of Belma. And it was fun to bring that beer around and share it with people and, and get some sensory ideas and impressions from other folks. One of those people in particular was, picture this man here, uh, Sarah Petrowski. Uh, the beer curator and Cicerone at Hogs Apothecary in Oakland. He really gave me a cool idea with Belma when he tasted the, the Belma IPA that I had produced and said, maybe you should try this with Pilsner malt or Kolsch yeast. And he was absolutely right. When I went back and tried Belma that way, I really got exactly what I wanted out of that hop. The Belma in many ways was a very difficult hop to work with. I almost wanted to give up on it and just move on and do something else, but I thought it would be an interesting experiment to keep pushing that hop, see if I could make it work somewhere. And I really think Kolsch is a very appropriate way to approach the hop. Once again, this batch splitting method is another way you can get some other interesting beers at the same time. As you notice in this example, the first five gallons that I collected from this 15 gallons of wort went straight into a Dortmunder type of beer. Uh, scored very well and is a nice, just easy drinking beer and is a good control batch as you taste through the other experiments. So to kind of summarize Belma, uh, really interesting sensory around this berry melon concept that you get from new hops. It uh, really shines well with Pilsner malt and just a slight ester quality of maybe you'd get from uh, Y-Yeast 3711 Saison yeast or uh, Kolsch yeast. It's not a citrus, aggressively citrus pine or dank hop. Um, Really neat, subtle characters that you're going to get from this one. So let's move on to 06300. That's a hop from the Hop Steiner program. That's one that was being pushed pretty aggressively in the craft beer market about a year ago. It's kind of disappeared from the market this year a little bit, but it is one that has a really interesting lemon quality to me. But it's also, in addition to lemon, you get a lot of really interesting complexity across the board from this hop. It's a hop that I wanted to approach quite a bit like Mosaic. I think it's actually quite a bit different than that, but it's one that you can send after an IPA as a blending component. And that's what I had done in blending it with uh, 05256 when I first started playing around with 6300. Uh, 05256 is the driving character hop in the beer that we're tasting today, the BNA9 Session IPA. When you smell and taste that beer, if you have any, a little bit of it left, I'm getting a really interesting, um, almost oregano and really dank component from that hop in this beer. And it's a really interesting uh, in, a character replacement hop as opposed to uh, CDZ or Apollo or something like that. Um, it was really fun to blend 05256 with 6300 the first time. I think that that method really worked fairly well. Um, some of the interesting stats about 05256, it really is a high oil hop and drives a lot of interesting complexity on the cold side for dry hopping because it's such a high oil hop. Definitely an IPA, APA focused top. You could use it elsewhere, but it seems very well, it seems like it fits very well there. So one of the first times I brewed with 6300 and 05256, I brewed a double IPA, and it was kind of cool to see that hop do really well in a, a local competition in the San Francisco Bay Area. To my surprise, it, it turned up a best of show, and I think that's less about me grandstanding about a best of show beer and more, but it speaks to volumes to the complexity of 05256 and your ability to use that in a beer that gives a lot of familiar complexity to us as beer drinkers and, and judges. I originally named the beer 6300, but I really think that 05256 in retrospect dominated the beer. I brought that beer to the Southern California Homebrew Fest and I 
have this really boring name, uh, 06300 IPA. Uh, Justin Crosley immediately renamed the beer to something more interesting, uh, <laughs> called it Dragon Semen IPA. And uh, <laughs> you can see him standing there kind of uh, heckling me as I'm about to change the keg and, and put it on. Um, that was before the beer had earned its best to show, and I just brought the rest of it along so we'd have something fun to serve at the SoCal Homebrew Fest. Um, really, really good festival if you're ever in the area of Southern California, look for that one. It was unfortunately canceled this year due to the way some of the laws are changing in, in California, but hopefully it will come back next year. I always go to Justin when you need a good name for a beer. He's got good ones. So let's move on to Mosaic. Mosaic's another hop that has really caught the attention of a lot of craft brewers and home brewers over the last year. HPC 369, uh, it has a really high myrcene content, myrcene being one of these oils that's really important for uh, American type hops. And one recipe that I'd settle on for Mosaic, uh, this idea of an IPA around Mosaic, uh, Mosaic Monster IPA. Can't stress enough, uh, please download this presentation later and click on some of the links. A patent that was filed for Mosaic in 2012 contains a lot of really interesting information about that hop. And as the breeders and growers bring new hops to the market and patent them, and are really interested in collecting royalties on these patents, They're, they want to differentiate themselves from the other hops that are already patented. A lot of really cool data in the patent itself, really objective data. There's a Google patent site where you can search that stuff too. And once you find a specific grower or a grower's name, you can kind of follow those links back and find out some really cool, interesting information about the hop. One hop that I'd paired with Mosaic originally this year when rebrewing Mosaic Monster a few times was this hop, Azaka, from the Dwarf Hop Association. That has a really interesting blend of fruity characteristics. First tried this hop last year at NHC in Philly. The uh, Flying Fish Brewery out of New Jersey had produced a beer called F.U. Sandy. Uh, tried it at a local bar. I thought that was just an awesome, awesome hop, and one I wanted to get my hands on later. Sure enough, they named it and released it to the rest of the market at the beginning of 2014 from the 2013 crop. So I took this approach, let's do an IPA with the Zaka and really make that fruit character stand forward. I'm not le learning my lesson from Belma here, apparently. Uh, I don't, didn't really get exactly what I wanted out of it, but it was really cool to batch split Azaka and Mosaic, and once again, kind of make a Mosaic monster beer as a control beer for Azaka. And the Mosaic beer turned out fantastic as usual, but the Azaka beer, I didn't get exactly the complexity that I wanted out of it. Still made a nice beer, just the aroma on Azaka, I think, fades pretty fast in a dry hop. Mosaic Monster Nicola loves that beer and says, uh, passion fruit whenever we've shared a few pints at home. I really think that's a cool way to think about mosaic character as it ages a little bit. But let's kind of summarize uh, Zaka really quick. I really get this cool candied mango or slight vanilla spicy spiciness out of it. You do get some classic stone fruit and uh, citrus out of it, but it's not necessarily an IPA hop. I think it has a way of bringing malt character forward. It would be a really interesting one to send after American Amber Brown or maybe even a barley wine. Uh, Drake's Brewery in San Leandro, not too far from where I'm at, created a, a really neat beer called uh, Drakeller IPA featuring Azaka, and that's been one of the more uh, successful IPA examples I've tasted with Azaka. And that had really neat generic fruitiness along with some vanilla, vanilla qualities. I think the, one of the risks with Azaka, though, after tasting it in a few beers, I think it could stand the risk of accentuating esters and acetaldehyde if there's any present. Uh, think good things to keep in mind. Let's kind of summarize Mosaic. Uh, it's really a North American hop that has a big Southern Hemisphere edge to it. If you tasted hops such as Nelson Savine, that really has that characteristic classic 4MMP white wine grape quality. I think that that's, this is the first North American hop that has a lot of that. A couple final comments about Mosaic. I think that hop can be easily muddled if you tend to try to blend it with too many other hops. And it's a hop that if you push it too much, you kind of get this diesel kerosene, a little bit too much of a rancid oil content. So first time you use Mosaic, try it with an even hand before you go aggressive with it. It's also absolutely disgusting with uh, elevated diacetyl. I think that it's a potential risk with this hop is that if you're struggling with diacetyl and your beers are using a yeast strain that pumps out a little bit of that, you're going to find that it's accentuated even more so with the complexity of Mosaic. Also, Mosaic is not a beer you want to whore it up on score sheets and, and in competition. Judges kind of get some weird things out of it at this point as people aren't quite familiar with it yet. Uh, gotten some really fun and interesting comments on score sheets back when submitting Mosaic beers. A lot of people get uh, sourness 
or maybe that was just the brewer. <laughs> really fun to serve mosaic beer to uh, beer fans. These are a couple picks from the Winter Brews Fest where they've been able to have homebrew as part of that event the last few years. Brewed mosaic monster there and served it for the first time last year. So many people asked me about it, had to brew it again and serve it there again this year, which was a big hit. Uh, mosaic can be a really cool crowd-pleasing hop. Let's move on to Legacy, the final of the three hops, uh, new hops that we're using in the session beer that we're tasting today. Uh, really like Legacy. It's a very subtle hop once again, but maybe a little less subtle than Belma. It's a really cool blending component. I think it stands out really well in just a very simple Bond Ale. I uh, recommend starting there. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of citrus, pine, or dank, even though you kind of perceive a little bit of that when you open the bag and smell it. Needs something with a little more subtle hand. So I started here, uh, Legacy Blonde Ale, and once again, kind of used Belma as a control, knowing that it seemed a little bit subtle, and uh, split it just two ways this time with Belma and Legacy. Um, made the mistake of dry hopping the Belma beer, which kind of ruined it, uh, won't do that again. And uh, Legacy really stood out well with uh, WLPO 29 Kolsch yeast, and just this really simple a malt bill of 50% pills, 50% raw. That beer was really awesome. I'm definitely going to repeat it. I, get, I really recommend if you want to play around with Legacy in isolation, try something like that. So to kind of summarize Legacy, it's this concept of 4MMP, that white wine grape, with a lot less of the diesel kerosene and some of the maybe the risks that go along with using a really aggressive 4MMP hop like Nelson Savine or Mosaic but it is a lot less flavor intensity. It's not necessarily an IPA hop. I think you want to send a more subtle beer after it. And probably the biggest risk in using a lot of Legacy is you're going to maybe get some of that caddy or boxwood or ribes type of character, some of the things that people hate about Simcoe. Uh, if they don't like that hop, you're going to get even more of that with a, a beer where you're pushing a lot of Legacy. I think in thinking about the beer that we're tasting today, Legacy has a supporting role kind of in the middle between 05256 being the primary hop that we're tasting in this beer, Legacy adding complexity in the middle, and then Belma kind of bringing up some interesting fruitiness in the end. Let's move on to El Dorado. El Dorado is a really interesting hop from CLS Farms, just released a couple of years ago. Uh, once again, Eric Dasmaris from CLS Farms really takes this approach that Let's get new hops to the market as quickly as possible. If they seem to be agronomically stable, let's make them available to brewers. There's over 2,500 2, craft brewers now, and, and all of them want something interesting. So let's, let's get them to market pretty quick. El, El Dorado is definitely a hop that came out of that approach. And uh, you find a lot of interesting single hop complexity in this hop. I think it's a classic example of a one-stop hop that maybe doesn't play as well with others, and you'd want to showcase it on its own, at least to start with. Once again, higher myrcene content, higher oil, higher oil content, lending itself well to American-style craft brewing. One hop that I kind of wanted to pair with El Dorado in playing around was ADHA 484. Uh, very high cohumulone, not something you'd probably want to bitter with, although cohumulone and bitterness, that we've learned this week, is not necessarily as correlated as we may have originally thought. Uh, really was intrigued by ADHA 484 and, and cedar and wood qualities that you get out of that hop. So paired it up with El Dorado and used it in the, uh, as a variation of the Brewcaster Challenge Schwartz beer. Uh, when Justin convinced us to do another Brewcaster Challenge, I thought, well, if I'm going to produce 15 gallons of wort, we'll do five for the show, and then I'll play around with new hop varieties with the other 10 gallons. Um, so once again, this concept of batch splitting, did a lager with the first five gallons, and then used the other 10 gallons to, to split between these two other hops. Really enjoyed uh, El Dorado in a slightly darker beer with just 001. I uh, really think that El Dorado, for whatever reason, I get a slightly woody, minty, northern brewer type of character out of it. A lot of people don't get as much of that, but I think it just speaks to me in a, a darker beer. Uh, something to play around with and think about is if you perceive all this complexity that we get from new hops, don't forget about non-typical styles. Uh, ADHA 484, after tasting it in this experiment, really seemed to bring some alcohol qualities forward in a good way. Thought that might be an interesting one to send after an Imperial Stout someday. So once again, this concept of we're, we're batch splitting a little bit and trying to use a few different hops at once so we can kind of compare and contrast. All the beers will have the same age. You have a control example, and then you have two different experimental examples. To kind of summarize what I perceived about El Dorado, um, really complex hop with high oil content, well suited for American craft brewing and home brewing. Um, Really liked it in a darker beer, but it can definitely do well in a single hop IPA. 
and that's something that Stone Brewing in, in Southern California has played around a lot with. If you've stopped by Stone Liberty Station, they've had a beer for a while called Lost City of Liquid Gold. That's an El Dorado-focused beer, really nice one. Uh, Mitch tells me they're going to release that as a double IPA at some point in the next year or so, looking to take that one to the commercial market. So check that out if you want to see El Dorado in an IPA-type context. Uh, once again, I think your biggest risk here is that it, it gets muddled fairly quickly if you're trying to combine it with a lot of different other hops. Midget Stone talked about in the early days they tried blending it with things like Mosaic. It really didn't work out well. So let's move on to Safir. This is one of the few non-American hops I'll cover today. It's been around for quite a while, but a hop that is a really crop-stable version of a noble hop for the German brewing market as Hallertau struggles to survive in the field. These guys are looking for ways in which they can continue to grow noble-type hops that have better crop stability. Uh, Safir is a really interesting, slightly fruity, slightly distinct version of a Hallertau, basically. Um, really like this hop in Pivo Pills. And a nice quote here from Matt Burleson about Safir as being a showcase, or uh, Pivo Pills as being a showcase for Safir in particular. Uh, if you want to seek out what Safir is like in late hop and dry hop, I highly recommend Pivo Pills. I blended Safir with ADHA871 and sort of doing this batch splitting experiment. ADHA871 is another hop from the uh, Dwarf Hop Association. It has characteristics of saws, and it had this really interesting descriptors like thyme, cucumber, and, and sage. I thought that might be kind of a cool one to contrast with, with Safir. So I made this idea of a recipe, uh, sacrilege pills, kind of modeled after Pivo pills a little bit. And then again, batch split that beer between Safir and ADA H H71 and did a very simple WLP830, didn't yeast split there, just a straight up lager yeast. Dry hopping with Safir for that variation and then dry hopping with ADA H871 dry hop there. Uh, that was a really classic version of pills, definitely got something that was along the lines of Pivo pills, really liked that one. And then. Uh, Cucumber and thyme did really come across in ADHA 871. Not in a really aggressive way, you kind of had to search for it, but it kind of made me think of like that cucumber water they serve at a spa or something. <laughs> kind of a neat beer. I really recommend playing around with 871 in a, in a really mellow beer. Um, and then again at the bottom, sometimes you, you get a, a wild, crazy idea, and I took an, and split that Saphir dry hop again with, uh, and scented Bretois after it. Uh, really, really like the results, at, actually. Uh, I think that you can get some cool complexity with uh, Brett and classic noble hops or classic noble hop derivatives as a good way to start with playing around with uh, Brett variations. So to kind of summarize, Safir is a hop with old school roots and a, lot of, and a little bit of new school complexity. I uh, really had fun with it and playing around with it in the Pivo Pills type of beer like Sacrilege Pills. Well, let's move on to some of the uh, newer hop varieties from the hop breeding program. Yeah. These are definitely some of the most sought after hops in the craft brewing industry. Hops that, this is the same breeding program that gave us hops like Mosaic and uh, Simcoe. These guys have come to market with a new hop this year. It's formerly called HBC 366, now called Equinox, named during the CBC this year. Uh, it's a daughter of Warrior and definitely has a lot of very familiar complexity. The hops, the folks at Sierra Nevada really like this hop. They kind of give you an indication of sort of where it would fit in their portfolio. I think a lot of classic citrus, but a much higher oil content than some of the other hops that are similar to it. Um, the idea being maybe you're using less on the dry hop side, but getting a, a more flavor impact with less vegetal matter. Once again, a patent application for this hop was an interesting heads up that they might be filing for a new, an actual name for this hop. So kind of trolling the patents for fun. If you want to geek out on hops, is a fun thing to do. I paired this hop up with HPC 344. Uh, once again, those goofy pictures of me earlier digging through the hops at some brewery was a uh, in fact, the Summit Brewery and Chip was really cool about helping us, helping me get some of those hops available. And uh, they had a little bit of 366 and 344. I uh, thought we'd send these after an IPA and uh, blended the two of them in a, a bat, same bat, batch splitting technique. But as I read through the descriptor of 344, I saw this, uh, they said unique green apple. And sort of alarm bells start going off about green apple is a hop descriptor, so we figured we'd give it a try and see what happens anyway. Fairly straightforward batch splitting thing here once again. Uh, just two variations this time, not three. Uh, sent Y-Yeast 1056 after it this time, uh, 366 and 344. Just two basic tracks there, nothing too exotic. And when trying a 366 example, definitely the one-stop hop, a hop that has a lot of 
complexity, uh, confirm the status of that. It's definitely going to be a hop you'll hear a lot of in the next year in the craft brew world. I think Equinox will, will pique a lot of interest. Uh, 344, it's a really interesting hop, but I think it kind of needs a blending component. And um, the fatal flaw of 344 will probably be that it's, it's slightly green apple character, but we'll see. Maybe that'll get a name over the next few years. Uh, 366, uh, some final comments here. Really interesting um, citrus zest quality with a little bit of the berry and melon, um, but not nearly as much as some of the other hops that are pushing a lot more berry and melon character, just a touch of that. Uh, no pine, no dank, no spice, just a lot of citrus type complexity. And as it aged some straight passion fruit into grapefruit, um, I guess maybe one of the risks with Equinox is that the public won't distinguish it enough between other classic sea hops. We'll see. Strongly recommend you give that one a try. Or if you stop by Russian River over the next year or two, they've started brewing a beer called Dribble Belt that features 366. And if you can see this picture that's faded in the background behind this slide, uh, that, what the heck is a Dribble Belt? Well, that is a picture of a Dribble Belt at a hop processing facility. Some final comments on 344. Uh, definitely some Apple Jolly Rancher type quality out of that. I didn't get quite an aggressive acetaldehyde, but that would be a risk in trying to push this hop too much more. Uh, definitely not a one-stop hop. It needs a blending component, but an interesting one nonetheless. Uh, 344 was a hop that you may have tried in the Ales for ALS blend. That was a portion of that component uh, last year. Seems to also maybe push a little acetaldehyde too. That might be another risk here because of that green apple thing. So let's take a step back and think about, so once you've taken and proven a new hop and found it interesting for your brewing technique, your brewing ideas, um, let's play around with changing a variable. You've repeatedly proven that you like the hop. I did this with uh, Mosaic Monster and sent different yeast strains after a new hop that I really liked. Um, there's a, a new yeast supplier called Yeast Bay. This individual, Nick, is. Uh, isolating interesting yeast strains and bringing them to the market, uh, produced by White Labs, and uh, really interesting stuff that he's doing. I really want to play around with those in this Mosaic Monster wart. So I sent his Vermont Ale, uh, Funktown Pale, which is Vermont and Brett blend, and his Wallonian Farmhouse Ale after this Mosaic Monster wart. Really focusing on an idea that I thought might work is that there's very little pine and dank and no classic sea hops who really focus on tropical and fruity. That's something that the Vermont Ale Yeast, I think, could support. So once again, batch splitting kind of three different ways. 15 gallons of the Mosaic Monster Wart, Vermont Ale Yeast, Funktown Ale Yeast, and the Wallonian Ale Yeast. Uh, knew that the two in the middle would probably be a risk. Um, so what the hell was I thinking? Phenols and um, American hops don't necessarily go well together, and I always think that Brett in beers always pushes a, a certain amount of phenols that clash with Certainly pine and dank, but I thought that was definitely a risk here too. But I figured, what the heck, we'll just go for it. Results are really surprising. Uh, Vermont was good, but maybe not as, quite as good as I had originally hoped. Uh, Funktown is really neat. Uh, the Brett strain that they use in Funktown seemed to push a lot of interesting aromatics, but not a lot of other phenols that would clash with the beer. Really neat sandalwood character out of that Brett strain that they're using in there. Um, the Wallonian Farmhouse was probably the riskiest of the bunch, definitely the most phenols from that yeast of the three that were picked here, but it was surprisingly really dry and interesting and, and had a very focused, slightly smoky phenol character that, oddly enough, seemed to work fairly well with Mosaic. I was surprised at how well Mosaic could do in the presence of that much ester and phenol. Made me re-challenge my assumptions a bit about working with these new school American hops and, and some of the more characterful yeast that you can send after them. So some closing comments. I think there are more unique and interesting hops than ever before. Uh, you should look beyond what everyone else is doing and create your own story and do your own recipe development with these new hop varieties. I think there's a lot that you can bring to the table and we're just at the tip of the iceberg in understanding what new cool stuff they could bring to your beer. When you're doing recipe development for these hops, make sure you brew into the hop's own strength and don't try and force it into a beer where it doesn't really fit. We're tempted to send a lot of these new hops after typical American styles, but I think they may do better in other places. So what next? I uh, really like to play around with more from the HBC program when I can get my hands on them. Uh, lots of new hops from the whole program that I've just gotten my hands on recently and haven't brewed with yet. Uh, Mandarina Bavaria and Whole Melon. I've really enjoyed the Session IPA from Firestone. They released very recently Easy Jack that features those two hops. It's an interesting commercial beer to try if you haven't tried that one yet. 
Um, and the USDA program, Kashmir in particular from that program, really curious to try that in a beer, have just acquired a little bit of, of that sample. But we'll see a lot more new ones over the next few years as all the different breeders and all the different suppliers want to get a foot in the game. They all want a, a Citra type of story. They want a hop that's an overnight sensation and they want to get our uh, brewing imagination interested in these guys. I encourage you guys to uh, download this presentation through the link provided here and as well as following me along on, on Twitter. I tweet about new hops, new hop varieties and what I perceive in them fairly frequently. And there you have it, straight from the mouth of one hop-obsessed home brewer, Nathan Smith, to your home brewery. I hope that not only he gave some good insights on some new varieties, but if nothing else, laid out that kind of framework of procedure of test brewing with any hop, whether it's new or an old school one that you haven't used a lot of or you want to go back to using. Uh, hopefully the process that he explained helps you more than anything. Big props to Nathan Smith and for the AHA and for the Bruin Network for allowing us in the door to document Nathan's presentation. We have several others from last summer that are yet to, yet to be edited. They'll be coming out over the fall and next uh, in the winter. And there's everything from blending yeast to historic and vintage beer styles to mash production for sour beers. It's all kinds of great stuff. So also big thanks to Brew Your Own Magazine for their continued support of Chop and Brew and to the fans for watching, for buying merch, for donating, for just giving mad shout outs and props on Facebook, Twitter, and beyond. We do it all for you, man. So let us know how your hop experiments go at those said social media. Get in touch, chopandbrew at gmail.com. Until the next time, chop for chop, brew for brew. Mm, it's all about you and them hops and these headphones. <laughs>